It's on. It's on yeah. there. It was flashing a bit earlier. Yeah, flashing. Is... Yeah, I think. I think the the thing is not turned on here. Okay. Uh-huh. I missed a step here. Sorry. It's okay. That's okay. okay. We'll fix it. It'll be fine. Okay. Should I talk a bit, or um... I'll, I'll I'll drink wine. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is always a good plan. <laughs> I think it's see that's that's There you go. So we can see. Ah, okay. Apologies for that. That's I'm back okay. to slide share. So that's um, over here. Slide share, screen share. Oh, where's it gone? Press it again, please. And then that one. This one. Yeah. Share. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Sorry. Thank you. That's all right. <laughs> so I think that, you know, the, with the, um, it's particularly the geography, it seems to be sort of bounded off from human realms. It seems to answer questions. Its meaning and value some tends to be essentialized and categorized for the sake of effective management and interpretation, compartmentalized with all the sort of geographical assumptions that that implies. And that's why I think it's sort of taken for granted. Why is it taken for granted? Well, you know, perhaps because of its ubiquity, but I think the manner in which heritage seems to be or becomes fixed and immutable, territorialized according to specific bounded scales, the local, the national, the universal, the universal, uh, and immutable, territorialized according to, uh, sorry, time tagged as well, according to delineated sequences of territory, of temporality. Uh, but this is both pervasive, but also consequential. It has consequences. And we have to think about what heritage, what work heritage does when it is classified communicated and enforced through such spatialized temporal and temporal boundedness and perhaps a more slightly more interesting question is uh, is how it might work uh, how, how it how what work it might be able to do uh, what might what work might a more relational notion of heritage is uh, uh, is capable of when it, if it is freed from such bindings so I'm going to look at a series of case studies to unpack this and ask some questions scratch away at some of the paradoxes and try to navigate towards a more purposeful sense of heritage. Looking at a series of different, I'm going to try and cover a lot of different things of landscapes, monuments, performances, uh, exhibitions, reenactments, all sorts of things. And first of all, just to sort of kick things off, to, to sort of to illustrate some of these tensions, is look at somewhere not far from, uh, from with Liscombe, actually, is, uh, is Tar Steps in Exmoor. To, uh, this, this, is, this is an ancient bridge. How old it is is, is, is often up for, is, is, you know, is disputed. Some people talk about it as prehistoric, some people talk about it as medieval, but I won't, I won't click and play this now. If you, but uh, what, 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 it's, what it seems to be, where, you know, this, is, this is something I picked up a couple of years ago, is it seems to be forever being knocked down and rebuilt again. It's at least 11 times in the last 60 odd years it's been washed away and rebuilt. So it's an ancient bridge, which, which on that uh, on that news item here gets talked about as being uh, ancient, prehistoric. It's actually mentioned in the same clip. It is prehistoric, perhaps from around 1000 AD. Uh, it is medieval. It's also Bronze Age, and they talk about it all in the same way of unknown age, which is probably the most honest answer I guess they can come up with. Really. So this is a so this is tar steps. Well, how old is it? They keep on rebuilding it again and again and again. And it's this is the idea that the, the primary origins are disputed, but actually it's the secondary origins that are actually the most important things. That, that the destruction provides an opportunity to maintain its meaning as an ancient, an ancient monument. This its incessant destruction or repeated <coughs> destruction provides an opportunity to materialize an image of the primary origins of the site. It acts to, so it can be reaffirmed as ancient and as authentic. Is a qu- quotes from the early 20th century. It is likely 
that they've been repaired so often after heavy floods that there's very little of the original bridge, if any, in its present structure, as I said, at least 11 times since the 19th, since that was actually written in the 1930s. Another nice quote from, the, from how it's sort of represented to emphasize a sense of ancientness is no traces of cement can be found among the stones so that the structure has preserved itself as a sort of miraculous preservation purely by the weight of its individual parts. But of course, it is actually rebuilt again and again and again. And the stones, although they're now supposedly numbered and tagged, and there's a bit obscure whether they really are numbered and tagged or whether they are just very, very carefully surveyed. But when you look at historical photographs, you can see that they, they have been moved around quite a lot. This was the oldest bridge. Um, we think this was about 1950 or 1951, just before... Uh, just before it got washed away in big floods of the, which were famous for the Linton, Linton floods actually in 1952, the whole lot got washed away. Uh, and this is the oldest bridge, the ancient, implies a sort of material continuity and authenticity, which is actually objectively absent. The historical character of Tar Steps, I think, is a matter of cultural convention rather than history. So where does this leave authenticity? As I said, nobody quite agrees to the primary origins, uh, but anyway, it's the, it's, it's, it's the secondary origins that are required uh, required to affirm the primary origins. The original origins, if you like, are dependent on the secondary origins of the bridge. As I said, this was 1950 or 51. 1948, it looked like this. It's a concrete bridge, and it's actually called Star Steps Temporary, sorry, Star Steps Temporary Bridge. Uh, this is an, around 1948, it's before there was a big rebuilding operation in, in the summer of 1949. And it's interesting as well that there's the, the last one, they, 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 the bridge that shows that re, you know, the, the images that really try and push the ancientness and naturalness of it, always look to the work towards from the east towards the west bank. Uh, whereas this one, because it's got sort of houses and so on in the background and a concrete temporary bridge. Uh, so it's the in, sort of incessant and ongoing enduring practices of rebuilding that are interesting here. This representation of the concrete bridge as temporary implies the existence of a permanent bridge, but the very presence of the concrete bridge highlights the impermanence of any bridge. Uh, you know, de facto, the, pre the, the presence of this temporary bridge makes all other bridges at this site temporary too. But despite this logical dissonance, uh, the triangulation of ancientness, naturalness, permanence, works to authentic authenticate an image of this site as being ancient. So Tar Steps get sort of petrified through conservation to act as a totem of ancientness, uh, as an icon of certain ideas about nationhood, and particularly as a baseline for technological progress. So you see it being very easily used sort of as, a, as an icon of being sort of ancient, almost natural, nearly natural, uh, and very much as the, the baseline of a nation which in this most recently, uh, this sort of series of stamps from the Royal Mail in 2015, uh, where they talk about this uh, 10 leaps of engineering that have seen UK bridges evolve from the humble stone crossings to iconic landmarks and construction triumphs. And of course, they've got a, a political, there's ones from sort of Western England and from Eastern England and from uh, Scotland and from Scotland there, I think, yeah, no, that's Wales, uh, from Northern Ireland. Uh, from the north of England in the Lake District there. And of course, this is here we've got Tar Steps, which is, as I said, the, the, the humble stone crossing, uh, which is the sort of vital referent, the start point, the, the baseline from which to measure the nation's progress. But it is actually the newest bridge on this entire selection of bridges. It's the most recently built bridge. So, OK, there's a sort of national... Uh, sort of, people talk about this as authorised heritage discourse, you could say, in a way. but it, But... Can we say a little bit more, particularly the way in which uh, that, that uh, uh, you know, a, a, a heritage icon such as Tar Steps is related so easily to ideas of national identity? Of course, this can be scaled up to look at entire landscapes, particularly uh, things like the the, the the Lake District, things like the national parks. This is something that Mike Crang, Divya Tolia, Kelly talk about. You know, national parks as inner places where there's supposedly inherent connection between certain types of landscape and a sense of genuine Englishness. And this Englishness has no place for ethnic minorities or any co connotation of multicultural society. This idea of the national park is based upon a, a sort of desirability to preserve uh, through the incessant and enduring management 
not of tar steps, but, whole, but a whole landscape as a, to foster a sense of native landscape, a nationalization of na nationalizing of nature. Tolia Kelly talks about this, you know, this collapsing of native national citizenship uh, is uh, uh, Tolia Kelly talks about as being ecological racism. The landscape is emptied or naturalized, leaving a sense of uh, a historical pure ecosystem. Uh, there's a simple bond between land, people, and nation. And this operates through notions of heritage. So this easy link between heritage and the nation, where heritage, sorry, that's the quote, uh, where heritage uh, answers the questions. So national parks in particular, is a, you know, where you get this natural heritage and cultural heritage getting categorized through the prism of the, nat of the nation. Uh, and the quote, which you could almost see under this, uh, uh, through a process, this is from Summer Tojo 2013, through a process of collective memory and memorialization, nationalism collapses time and space, the past and the present, into a single narrative located in a single, a single place. So the message here is that uh, ideas of landscape, ideas of heritage, ideas of nation, fit naturally together with the stability of one informing and underpinning the characteristics of the other two. No matter which way round you view that the relationship, they all answer each other's questions. The characteristics of heritage, landscape and nation answer questions in a manner that makes critical interventions sometimes quite difficult. And of course, aligning these terms is always a political decision. These landscapes are curated, but the politics of this decision often tend to get glossed over. And this is what Talia Kelly is, and, and Krang are getting at when they talk about this nationalizing of nature, nature and a racialization of the landscape. This is, doesn't just happen in the UK. There's a, I spent a year or so in Finland a couple of years back. Uh, and again, this is Kali in uh, eastern Finland. And this is supposedly the, you know, the, the Finnish landscape. And it's the, this, the easy tag between Finland and landscape through a, a certain mm -hmm. set of natural heritage characteristics, which is the, the point I'm getting at here. And as if you look at the, uh, the uh, Finnish landscape service, they talk about Finland has 156 scenic areas. Someone's gone around and counted them all, defined by governmental decree as of national importance. And of these, 27 have been selected as national landscapes. So if you, I don't know if that means if you don't live in those 27, you're not in Finland or what, you know, they sort of took, but this look, Collie is a national landscape. And it's interesting that it's, it becomes a national landscape because it's one of the very few parts of fin Finland. It's a very flat country, and it's one of the very few bits where there's a lump big enough, a, a hill big enough, where you can actually get to view, to see this landscape of lakes and forests and so on. So it's sort of it's, it's it becomes a national iconic landscape by dint of being very different to everywhere else in Finland. But then in the summer, in the sort of silly season, you could say in the when when uh, in the just in August in 2016. Uh, I picked up some um, newspaper clippings about another part of Finland, right up in the very far northwest. Halti is the highest point in Finland and Norway, on, right on the border between Finland and Norway. And the mayor of this area is right up in the far northwest, and the mayor of the parish, this, this big parish or area of, of uh, Norway here, has, uh, has got a bit of a debate going and, uh, and it's bit of a, to donate a little patch of land to Finland because it's Finland's 100th anniversary. It's Finland's 100 next year, 1917 to 2017. So because Finland's going to be 100 years old, uh, some people in Norway have decided to be really nice to donate a little bit of Norway to Finland, because then they'll have a higher bit of land and actually have a peak, because there isn't a peak in Finland. They're stuck with, with the highest point in Finland. It's right on the border fence. I don't suppose it's a fence, but there's a right on the border here, 1,325 meters. They get an extra six meters and a peak if they just if they get given this extra little bit of, of Norway. And there's a Facebook page which is being run by a load of Norwegian expats in uh, in America, and uh, you can see the sort of zooming in here now. Uh, there's the, there's the present border. Oh, they just need that little bit there, then they can have a peek. <laughs> and you can see this as a sort of uh, the mayor. There's the uh, the mayor of in in Norway. There has said. Uh, it would be really good to give this as an anniversary gift so to allow Finland on its centenary to rewrite both its history and its geography books. And the, the uh, uh, Facebook page associated with this has, has quite a few tens of thousands of links. I'm sure probably of likes. It's probably now hundreds of thousands of likes. Uh, 
the, I read about this in the, in the uh, Danish paper Politiken and also the, the Guardian and the New York Times and elsewhere. The Guardian, the very, very final, the, the last line about it, it's a very jaunty sort of summer, August, August sort of uh, story, really. Uh, it's all very positive, it's all very jolly and nice. Public reaction has been overwhelmingly positive in both Norway and Finland, with the only objections so far coming from the indigenous Sami communities, reindeer roam freely across the border and you argue that the land should belong to neither country. So what have we got here then? We got sort of, this show, in some ways, I think it's a really aggressive form of gift giving, really, the sort of people in Norway sort of saying, here, Finland, ha ha happy birthday, 100 years. Uh, you know, here's your new highest point, but we're still a little bit higher over here because the real peak of, of Halti is right up here. It's another 40 odd meters, so it's a sort of, uh, so it's, it's a sort of aggressive gift giving on, on the part of Norway. It underlines the sort of arbitrariness of boundaries and, and of aligning communal identities of nation states with specific landscapes. But also, particularly in this final line, which is just this throwaway line at the end of the, of the, uh, of the piece there, airbrushes out the marginalized peoples by implication that the practices that count with respect to these landscapes is, is clicking the like button on Facebook. Uh, that the practice of reindeer herding isn't really very important. We should carefully gloss over or, or ignore any colonial overtones, overtones of how the Sami people and Sami society have been abused and marginalized. So, I mean, that's national branding and its consequences, its arbitrariness, who it includes and who it marginalizes. The nation, I think, is philosoph philosophically quite weak, but it's uh, politically obviously a very powerful structure. So what's the answer to this then? Maybe the local is the answer. A lot of, there's a lot of store always put in the idea of local heritage is a, really, is a really good positive thing. Now I've done a little bit of work on some local heritage, an example of Padstow in Cornwall. They have a hometown, and I'm from near Penzance originally. Uh, and uh, Padstow, if anyone knows it, on the north coast of Cornwall, uh, it's, got its, own, it's got lots, it's a very pretty place. Some problems of uh, inside, you know, incomers and so on, and the very expensive Rick Stein, he's, very, he's the famous man at Padstein, they call it, and he's got four restaurants, I think, dotted around the harbour here. Um, but there's one, there's one event that all the people of Padstow can seemingly come together, and that's Darky Day, uh, where every New Year they can all dress up uh, as uh, black and white minstrels and pl prance around the town singing loads of songs uh, about black people, quite derogatory songs about black people. Now, this was, has been seen as a, um, you know, it's been picked up and been accused of racism and so on. It's interesting, the Wikipedia take on this is that so they say, although some outsiders have linked the day with racism, Padstonians insist that it is not the case. So any outside critique is trumped by insiderness. Can't be racist because the people of Padstow say that it isn't, and they know because they're from Padstow. So they've now they've, there's a police investigation in it. Uh, and so uh, the, the organisers have been told that to rebrand the day, so they now call it Mummer's Day. We don't sing the old song because you know we had problems, so whenever we put the N-word in it, we now change it to Mummer, he grins, so now we're politically correct. So that's all right now. Um, if you look at it on the, uh, yeah, if, there's, there's, uh, yeah, Bernardo's report, Cornwall is very racist. Uh, but there's this idea of the innocent local heritage being threatened by a metropolitan elite. You can't question heritage because this is local heritage. And when you think about, you know, the local population celebrating their identity uh, through an embedded practice, uh, effective, emotional performance, uh, is more local, more real, more authentic. It's the sort of thing that heritage practitioners love, isn't it? So how can be, you know, but if you look at it on the internet, you get a whole different sort of series of questions. Here. This is just uh, this is sort of chat rooms about it. Don't get me wrong. Uh, don't get the wrong idea. Most pads, most people in Padstow will tell you they're not racist. At least no more than anyone else in this great country. Coloureds are welcome. The Cornish wouldn't treat them any differently from any other outsiders. And anyway, how can you be racist if there aren't any blacks around to be racist against? Old Padstonians see nothing wrong in dressing up like black-faced minstrels parading through town and belting out songs about the N-words. Uh, Cornish aren't racist, they're real. I've lived in Padstow all my life, and I can, so therefore I can sp speak on behalf of the whole town. This is not racist. It is those people like MPs who have nothing better to do than scrutinize and pull apart true British Cornish traditions. So on what terms can we be pro-local? You know, this is a local practice. Localness here, though, by definition, is white. It cannot be questioned. 
if it's questioned, it supposedly becomes under threat. It all based, is based upon an understanding of place as a bounded and stable thing, and as of a heritage that is a bounded and stable thing. Localness provides the answer. It is simply not reflected upon. A debate is closed because the debate threatens heritage. The local population wanting to celebrate their identity through an embedded practice, uh, you know, that seems great, but on what terms should we, you know, how can we challenge this? Just as we shouldn't see the heritage of nations as stable and essential, I would say neither should we see uh, such, such things as the local community as stable and essential. We should look towards the politics and power dynamics upon which they are contingent. So, okay, that's a bit about spatial fixing. I was going to talk a bit about uh, temporal fixing, which I'll just skip through a bit, really. Uh, but it's just very, very easy. You, know, you get this sort of idea in Dartmoor here. This is a Bronze Age landscape, but it's an you know, early 21st century landscape. It's, it's Regency Sidmouth. Uh, and it was a very extreme example, I think, in a way, is the is, uh, 1513 country up in north of Northumbria, where as though you know, there's, not, there's a lot of battlefield sites. There's not actually a great deal to see in, in, in the landscape today. Uh, but it, but it's it, the name Flodden 1513. This is 1513 country, as though the whole, understanding this whole country is only really managed manageable through relating it to sort of dynastic squabbles and of uh, and 16th century power squabbles between uh, Tudor and Stuart dynasties, uh, and and it's you know nothing's happened since of any consequence. You also get some very strange anachronisms. This this. Uh, monument was put in in 1910, I think. Uh, but if you look at the guidebooks and so on today, or tapestries, you see people fighting, around, you know, uh, sort of reenacting that the battle was taking a place around this monument from, uh, uh, from 1910, even though it's 1513. I suppose a more provocative example of this, which is, which again was in the press, rather than August 2016, it was August 2015, Palmyra, you know, this is newspaper, you know, it, it suddenly became in the, really big in the newspapers in 2015. And it's uncomfortable, really, is, is this sort of about when is heritage or where is heritage? A lot of World Heritage Sites like the idea that, it, that uh, well, they have to, as part of their, their uh, application to become World Heritage Sites, they need to sort of time tag themselves. In this case, it's the Temple of Bell, which is a second, you know, third century, destroyed in the third century. The Temple of Bell, that's, that is Palmyra. That's what we should be talking about when we talk about Palmyra. Um, I, I ended up looking at this and thinking, well, in some ways, well, can iconoclasm be classed as a version of intangible heritage? Uh, you know, after all, there's an awful lot of, of iconoclasm in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries in particular, which is now itself classed as a version of intangible heritage. Uh, you know, also, I thought, well, why are all the stories all, all, all end up talking about the ruins? rather than talking about this man, poor old Khaled al-Assad, who uh, was the archaeologist in, in, uh, in charge of Palmyra, who was murdered. The newspapers didn't seem so bothered about him. They seemed much more concerned about Palmyra and the authenticity of Palmyra. And these front page images on newspapers, it was all from newspaper shops, these ones, uh, are strange because almost every single newspaper went with this version of showing a space where Palmyra used to be. So it's presence marked through absence. You, you know, many of the newspaper images required a before and after shot that, so that the viewer could see what they were literally not seeing. A photo of nothing, where the lack of anything is the point being made. But what is Palmyra? You know, as I said, the, the UNESCO description talks about it being a, a temple complex from the first and second centuries AD, AD as though it's somehow stuck in time, uh, somehow does not exist in any other period, a discursively entrapped. If you look about, think about the biography of the site, the life history of the site. The Temple of Bell was destroyed in the third century. Christian church in the Byzantine era, then it was a mosque in the seventh century, then it was a citadel in the 12th century. By the 16th century, Palmyra, that as a town had been bypassed really, it was a small village in the ruins of what was described as an old temple. But then it got turned into a prison in the 19th century, and it was the French that turned it into a site of antiquity in the 1920s, having also used it as a prison for a while. So if you want to, well, there's lots of calls, we must return this to what it was before it became a heritage site. If we want to return it to what it was immediately prior to it becoming a heritage site, they should rebuild the French colonial prison. Uh, by removing the local population, transferring, um, transferring them to a newly built village nearby, the French cleanse this site 
uh, of, of people and declared it as an item of cultural heritage to be understood within the context of colonial power structures of Western European renditions of architectural categorization, discursively entrapped as a site without people. Well, the Temple of Bell has only been the Temple of Bell for about 200 of the last 2,000 years. Uh, this is a universal site of heritage that is now universally known as a former World Heritage Site, now more famous than it ever was as an edifice, built edifice. The destruction is just the latest phase of the site's ongoing biography, and for most of the time the temple has been in ruins. Like the Atlantis of legend, the site is now generally known through its destruction more in the public mind than ever, and like Atlantis, the non-existence of the site conveys a sort of lesson that perhaps has agency and an effective capacity in its, absent, in its absence, it is perhaps more present than it ever was as a managed ruin. Uh, Palmyra in the media is simply used to act as an example of heritage. It is not a real place, but simply an example of culture that serves a political argument. And drawn from the work of Nick Shepard, a South African post-colonial archaeologist, this practice of time tagging can perhaps be equated to an act of epistemic violence, as though the only means through which heritage can be understood articulated, valued, categorized is through a linear and modern Western conception of time and a framework that is bound to the fate of Western nations. So this, you know, the, so, uh, uh, this site or these landscapes can ended up be, end up being neatly bounded and boxed according to the nomenclature of, that reflects expertise of, uh, of uh, professional uh, archaeologists and statutory land management agencies. Uh, so this time tagging acts as a sort of discursive entrapment. So if we think about heritage, I think often involves decision making and which reflects a politics, a geometry of power. And there's a, this search for stability, I would say, is often aligned with a, quite a, a reactionary and conservative politics. It's an excuse to build walls, that present power structures, present political boundaries, and the mosaic of nations and states must not change. There's a sense of, as, as a, a sort of dream of preservation which conjures an ideal of perpetuity. In the case of Darky Day in Padstow, we've seen how the celebration of local heritage can end up enhancing racist and exclusionary politics at a local scale. But if you look across Europe today, there seems to be an ever-growing celebration of borders, and much of which uh, uh, seems to be pushing certain uh, sort of you know, defending your sort of defending oneself through reference to ideas of heritage as a, an essential stable thing which must be remain you know must be preserved. A lot of this was brought home to me when I was looking at the, some of the stuff connected to the centenary of the First World War in the last year or so. Um, there's a sort of paradox here that uh, a lot of it was this idea you know, came you know ran through narratives this idea that we must not let this happen again, but that wars and death are somehow needed to underline who we are. The heritage of war is enacted through various commemorative practices and shores up national borders. Heritage answers questions. Our borders must never be breached. The blood swept lands and seas of red, uh, installation at the Tower of London, 888,246 poppies. Uh, you know, poppies for every, 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 each poppy representing a British military death. Uh, no allies. No one, from, no, no, no one from the imperial troops, and certainly no one of the enemy being mentioned. This is about national pride and a sort of undifferentiated, mawkish, mawkish poignant reflection. And there's also, I think, a very strong idea of celebrating present, uh, present wars, both directly in terms of each of those poppies costing, I think, 25 pounds. The money went towards a series of uh, military charities, but also tacitly supporting present foreign endeavors in Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere. I think one of the most uh, strangest, uh, you know, there's sort of Afghanistan, leave your tribute. One of the most strangest uh, tribute events that took place here uh, was this in Cheltenham at GCHQ, where the staff of GCHQ came out and dressed in different, or held up different pieces of colored card to create a gigantic poppy in the middle of their secret listening base at Cheltenham. I have no idea what the Taliban must have thought of this, but you know the British troops are trekking around Afghanistan, burning fields of poppies, and yet back in Britain there's a sort of worship of the poppy and this gigantic poppy. You know the, the secret the, the secret service constructing this human poppy, which can only be seen by passing spy satellites and drones. So we have this celebration of borders, which 
I, you know, I'm getting, I have to say, this is what Europe seems to be about, and increasingly so with the refugee crisis. This idea of Europe being a mosaic of separate cultural entities. Uh, but I think there's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a very important difference between uh, you know, celebrating difference and celebrating a sort of distinction, that distinction of supposedly unique bounded ent ent entities set out in a sort of mosaic. And I think heritage often gets used to support some ideal of heritage, sorry, sorry, some ideal of separate, stable, unique cultures where culture is some sort of essentialized, uh, sort of super organic, unchanging element, unchangeable element. People might talk about tolerance, but it's always tolerance of something that is forever bounded as distinct, which must remain distinct because of the heritage. And I have to say, I'm frightened by a Europe that celebrates diversity if this diversity is always couched in terms of being made up of a mosaic or a patchwork quilt of unique, unchanging units. Uh, we ought to be celebrating difference, but recognizing that we live in a hybrid and dynamically changing world, certainly recognizing that there are differences between groups of people, but that all these differences are made up of blends that we have responsibility to protect the rights uh, to be different. Um, I was talking about this with a colleague, and he pointed me to the, to the songs of MIA. If you ever come across a Maya Alu Pragasm, uh, is a rap artist from East London, and it's just a nice quote, I thought, is a, is a quote from a Big Issue interview she did, where she talks about her being bored of the neat and handy packages people try to place her in. I'm not anything. I'm not precious about being Asian. I'm British. I'm Sri Lankan. It's all confusing. I don't give a shit. I'm, I'm totally British, totally American artist. I really wanted to bring new ingredients to the pot of England. But what do you do about these things? And this is something that I was thinking of this, uh, this summer. Uh, I was in Denmark, and uh, you see these sort of, you know, this, this sort of Denmark's fascination with Vikings uh, and that celebration of Vikings. You know, we got the, the, the poppies of, uh, of GCHQ in Denmark being built as this huge new uh, Viking museum just at Slagel, so just outside Copenhagen, where the thing is in the, in the shape of a gigantic Viking shield, which if you follow the, the architect's uh, plans, seems to be a Viking shield left casually in the, in the forests outside Copenhagen. So, that, so if you fly your satellites over Denmark, you, it's imprinted literally with this sort of, this sort of Viking idea. Um, now, you know, this, this is a, you know, as it went to, re oh, sorry, reenactments at uh, Merskord here in, uh, near uh, in Aarhus. And it's sort of very much this sort of sense of uh, pride of Viking heritage. And the, but this heritage is often uh, celebrated, I would say, through ideas of seafaring often, uh, as sort of intrepid, fearless adventurers. There's this huge celebration of boats and of movement and of mixing. And this is something that uh, you see, I guess, you, you, is unavoidable if you live in York, uh, the sort of the, the, that, that celebration of Viking heritage. This is something I saw uh, in, in Exeter, actually, just a few weeks. I'm sure there's lots of, of car stickers like this, maybe around this part of the world. I apologize for the road, road congestion. I'm a Viking immigrant. Um, and I was thinking, well, how, to, how can one do this in a slightly different way? And this is just something I've been trying out uh, in you know, trying to think about, well, how does, what, what's the implications of this celebration of Viking movement mean then? And I looked at some of the websites from the uh, Roskilde Viking Ship Museum and uh, just swapped around some, uh, you know, slightly provocative way, really, swapped around some of the images on their, on their website. And this is the one, climb on board a Viking ship. But what if you said, refugees keep coming to Greece in overcrowded boats? We were at sea for a long time, 15 hours, the motor started to die. Genuine sailing experience in the Nord traditional Nordic boats with a scent of wood tar in the nose. It's just sort of, I don't know where I'm going with this, but it's, uh, it's something I've been trying out and I might find myself never being allowed back into Denmark again. Uh, but, or at least they might take my watch and other valuables, if you might have read about that, that they're starting to do. But it's sort of that celebration of, of uh, Viking heritage, being trying to rethink it in a slightly different way. So, where do, you know, so trying to think of things differently, this interconnection of time and space. I think there's two things connected here. The spatial politics of not, you know, not being bounded nationally, trying to look beyond nations towards a sense of movement, making space for non-elite, co-production, uh, of dialogue, uh, celebrating relations rather than boundaries. But also this sort of, as, as I called about heritage with purpose, perhaps, reflecting on temporality, 
trying, you know, trying to get beyond linearity, trying to make space for dynamism, for evolution, for time depth, emphasis, emphasis of the future, uh, heritage that acts as a prompt for action in a forward thinking manner. Maybe we can reinvigorate a sense of nostalgia, not as a reactionary illness, but as a subversive challenge to standard heritage discourses. And this buys into some work recently where people have talked about you know, Alison Blunt and Stephen Legg and a few others talk, talk about purposeful nostalgia, mobile nostalgia, counter memory, in which heritage might perhaps have uh, emancipatory potential. So I'm just going to very quickly look at a few examples of this. Oh, yep. Uh, a coastline that you where you have to preserve change. A little bit of look at Runnymede and some, I'll, I'll get there in a minute because I'm just sort of thinking. I'm run out of time, Alex. So Jurassic Coast, another World Heritage Site in East Devon and Dorset, preserving change. You know, it's always tagged as uh, as England's first natural World Heritage Site. And I've got a problem with each of those words, really. Uh, it's, uh, is problematical all the time. And one of the most interesting things about it is that they're tasked to preserve change. Uh, the actual boundaries of the site are going to change with every single uh, every single time the tide goes in or out. It's, it's described as being from the top of the cliff line to the to the low tide level. So every time there's a cliff fall, there's a the, the boundaries of the site change. They have to they you know they have to uh, they have to preserve dynamic processes of erosion. So the everyday, everyday management must ensure that the, the coast be allowed to crumble and erode. So this is perhaps an example of heritage as a, imagined as a, an uncompleted process rather than a bounded and static thing. Now at Tar Steps, we thought, saw how the constant rejuvenation allowed a symbolic link to the ancient past to be maintained. But at the Jurassic Coast, the practice of allowing erosion and decay provides an essential link to a notion of deep time both stretching back to a past that is so long ago, it's difficult to comprehend. Uh, you know, the Jurassic period wasn't really England, or England didn't necessarily mean very much in the Jurassic period, uh, but also perhaps a, a space for finitude, that things might not be forever. So on the, on the Jurassic coast, there's a heritage of dynamic environmental change where the object of heritage value, uh, is, where change is the object of heritage value, where you have to preserve change. So what does danger mean when stability is only relevant within limits, is often unachievable and might not even be desirable? So, okay, that's sort of trying to make space for evolution and dynamism. What about some dialogue? Spaces for uh, uh, other stories, perhaps. Well, Runnymede is one of these sort of key monumental landscapes of the British Isles, uh, a key space for uh, state-sponsored pageantry, pageantry, but it's also a space of protest. Uh, the site was, was, was uh, the, the state tried to sell off the site in the 1920s, uh, but there was huge protest about it. And it's largely because the site was actually a, a common land and their all common rights were, being, were going to be extinguished uh, where, as it was being sold off. Eventually, they came to compromise uh, and it was put, in, given to that hand, put into the hands of the National Trust in 1932. Uh, and at the opening of the, of their, uh, of the National Trust site at Runnymede, uh, the night before, um, the uh, uh, persons unknown managed to get in and spray creosote and all sorts of nasty, nasty messages over the monument. So the Prince of Wales, when he's opened up the site, got, got a you know, was had to be warned beforehand that uh, the site was was a you know being actively challenged by people who were were cross that the ironic really that to celebrate this, the, the essence of freedom for Magna Carta and so on, that they had to, to, to extinguish all sorts of uh, local, uh, um, local commons right. Now, heritage, you know, Runnymede rather is still a site of protest, heritage used to prompt and, and reimagine different futures. Uh, overlooking the memorial zone at Runnymede is the Diggers 2012 Eco Camp. Uh, it got moved this summer actually, but it was there for about four years. Uh, from 2012, and they call for the land to be owned by the masses following the example of the 17th century diggers movement who established their egalitarian rural settlement on nearby St. George's Hill in 1649. Mm -hmm. For the present day diggers, this is a legitimating past where a version of history around which they can form their identity. Now, whether the account that they talk about is actually accurate or not isn't really the point. What's important is how the idea of the past acts as a prompt to mobilize the present 
uh, the memory of the Diggers 2012 site suggests a sort of anti-authorized heritage discourse where notions of heritage are malleable. Stories are reworked to provide a moment of transformation in the ways that community can be conceived. Uh, heritage is a living thing. Uh, Alan Rice has talked a bit about this, uh, this idea of guerrilla memorialization, where there is a sort of future orientated responsibility being prompted by the site such as a site such as Runnymede. These lands belong to the people. This is very much a future orientated challenge. But we also found uh, another, you know, the, the actual site where supposedly the Magna Carta was signed is Anchorwick Yew Tree down by the river, uh, the River Thames. We also found uh, sort of more humble conversations, I suppose, that subvert the, the, the sort of the, the authorized discourse uh, in a sort of, in a sense of dialogue rather than overt opposition, reconfiguring perhaps our understandings of the commons. This tree was a na has been a national tree since 1998, looked after by the National Trust on behalf of this nebulous idea of future generations. And it's become part of a broader national heritage narrative. Ownership is performed through restriction and curtailment. Visitors, as you can see, are entreated to move on, warned to leave without trace, look but do not touch. Uh, it's a 2,000 year old tree, but is now being recognized as a national tree of the United Kingdom. Uh, but people haven't left Anchorit U completely as they found it. There's all sorts of, you say, sort of memory work going on. This makes the tree, you know, the National Trust has made the tree visible. They've declared it national, they've protected it. Visitors are demanded to be active participants in the, in the renewal, but in doing so, they, it has become open to interpretation. Perhaps this is a, a space which, which reflects a sort of broader yearning for enchantment, uh, personal memories being acted out on a very public stage. This is a, you know, th these acts are, you could, you could say, a relational enterprise, purposeful, unco but uncoordinated, unlike, unlike the diggers. So the story of Runnymede is, is how efforts, uh, the efforts of a national story through the National Trust are always undermined and reorientated by everyday actions in the 1930s protests, the Diggers 2012 site and so on. Uh, you know, the access of, to the tree is marked by proprietary rights at Anchorwick. Signs and information boards tell you, tell the visitor what they're, that they're entering a place of historic significance. But we witness how the appropriation of a natural site into uh, an elite and authorized discourse <coughs> makes the unofficial possible. It causes the site to become a focal point for collective acts of remembering to occur. I'll just quickly have a look at the, the site on Dartmoor, another national park. And this is sort of three stories about the same event, really. Um, this is in 1638, where the devil came to Dartmoor. Uh, this is a, this is local local legend and local folklore. It gets talk, there's a lot about it on the internet, but it's been an oral oral legend at least for 150 years or more. Um, and he came on the 21st of October, 1638. He comes to Dartmoor, he goes to the Tavistock Inn, and he has a pint. Um, and uh, you can tell, you can, and, and the, you, the, the barmaid could tell she was the, he was the devil because he uh, his, it hissed when he drank. Um, he had, uh, the, the, he paid for his, paid for his drink with uh, uh, gold coins that turned to dried leaves as soon as he left. And he also had crazy <coughs> boots. So, if you remember nothing else, if you, you know, if you learn nothing else from this, then remember if you how to spot the devil. <laughs> Cloven hooves, pays for, pays for his, doesn't pay for his drinks. Actually, I've known several people like that. But, yeah. um, but so uh, anyway, he comes, walks up the up the valley towards Widdicombe, and there's there's uh, people gathering in the church at Widdicombe in the moor, uh, and one of them is Jan Reynolds, who had done a pact with the devil several years previously to be brilliant card player. And the gambler whose lucky streak was about to be run out, about to run out. Hannah Sackett was the person who did these these uh, paintings, these drawings, by the way, a little cartoon from a blog I did about it a, few, a couple of years ago. Uh, so the devil came to collect this overdue debt, and he crashed through the ceiling of the church, and he picked Jan Reynolds up, carried him over the moors, and as he went away, he dropped his, Jan Reynolds dropped his cards up his, uh, the aces up his sleeve. And they turned into enclosures on the moors. And that is the ex explanation for these strangely shaped enclosures that you still see today. If you look at the site's monument record of this particular one, it just says diamond shaped enclosure of unknown age or, or you know, perhaps medieval question mark. Uh, uh, no, there is no entrance, which does make it quite a mysterious. You know, there's, no, there's no obvious entrance to it. It does make it quite mysterious. 
Um, and you know, that's the very, that's the most clear one. Actually, the other ones are a bit more. You know, is that really a heart shape? But never mind. There's the diamond. Is there very very clearly? But then there's this other version. Joshua Brooking Rose, 1638, and published in a series of pamphlets in October and November, uh, which recounts a particular event in in uh, which happened in Widdicombe. Widdicombe near the Dart Moors in Devonshire on Sunday the 21st of October last, 1638. And this talks about, in effect, this is known now as one of the very full first accounts of ball, I said ball thunder, maybe that should be ball lightning, ball lightning probably, isn't it? Um, and he carried, you know, he describes how this, this uh, event happened. There are, you can still see in the parish records, I think seven people die, uh, including the, the, the wife of the minister, um, and uh, there's, and the, the the local landowner or the the factor of the local landowner comes and does a sort of quasi scientific investigation, goes up into the tower and measures the blocks and how how far they were distributed from the church tower and measures the black marks and so on. There's a sort of very sort of descriptive account. This whole thing here is verified by eyewitness, is validated by different sorts of measurements. But if you go to the church today, what you see instead is this sort of very religious. A, uh, description of exactly the same event and you can see there's sort of an interesting you get the idea that there's lightning involved here in a way if you look back at it with hindsight one man had money in his purse which melted was in part a key likewise which hung there too and yet the purse no hurt save only for some black holes so small as with a needle made but this time this is all about God's judgment and certain people got killed that's just God uh, smiting people it's just, you know just if your luck's up your luck is up uh, and there's it's sort of in, you know, in, you know, interpolated through various sorts of um, uh, quotes from the Bible. So you have here this sort of same story. The national story of Dartmoor National Park doesn't really make sense for any of it, really. But there's a sort of religious authoritative narrative of heritage that uses the, uh, the Bible as evidence. You've got a scientific narrative of heritage where the er evidence is a sort of early form of empiricism. Uh, but then you also have a sort of non-elite heritage of... Uh, with the devil and so on, uh, where the evidence itself is in the landscape, that diamond-shaped enclosure. That, that, what, why does that there? How, we, what's the explanation for that? So there's a sort of uh, conversation between human and non-human, science and arts, everyday interpretation of the world, religious and supernatural. Uh, and it confounds a national story. It also confounds any sort of attempt at a sort of temporal, easy temporal linearity and progression. Ideas of palimpsest don't really make much sense here. Uh, you know, so certainly ideas maybe of chiasmus, you've heard about that, that sort of folding idea. Maybe that made more sense. And the last example I wanted to just draw on quickly, because to talk a bit about uh, climate change, actually, is Ironbridge Gorge, another World Heritage Site in the, less, in the West Midlands. This time the tagline is the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but you could say, really, it's a... Um, this is this is you know, the, the, this is where the heritage of anthro the anthropogenic capacity to affect climate is celebrated. <coughs> this is one of the key sites in the her the heritage of anthropogenic climate change. Um, you know, this is the one which you know. This is you know. Look, humans can master the world, transform the world to our will. A sort of a site of industrial devastation and awe. I noticed recently that. Uh, these buildings were voted not long ago as the the, the world's most alarmed-looking buildings. You can see why I quite like that. Maybe that maybe it's because they're worrying about climate change. Um, but so this is a World Heritage Site delegate de dedicated to the capacity for humans uh, to alter climate, a, a, a heritage of total transformation. Uh, that it, in some ways it, it, it implores us to what to look towards the future. You get some of the ideas of this if you look at this sort of contemporary painting by uh, J Philip James de Lutherberg in the early 19th century. This sort of sense of industrial awe and devastation. Just how screwed up a world are we, go are we going to make here? Through reference to these ideas of the past, there's a sort of odd link, I think, to some ideas about sort of climate change science and climate change science fiction. Uh, yeah, a lot of these things with Planet of the Apes or the Martian Chronicles and so on is a sort of is a sort of nuclear war. I guess they're written in the 1950s with the in the, with the uh, uh, threat of third world war behind them. But Hello America, J. G. Ballard, it is a, an environmental disaster which is a, which is a communicated through reference to heritage sites being destroyed. Um, you know, there's a, there's a history to this. Uh, one of the very first German. Uh, 
German uh, I, uh, books that puts forward an idea about glacial theory. There's a painting was done for it. This is uh, this is the uh, this is in Bavaria, and you can see the city of Ravensburg just near just here just disappearing beneath glacial meltwaters and so on. And it was decided the the uh, um, uh, publisher Otto Meyer decided not to put this in the book because he didn't want to scare the population uh, by 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 referring to this sort of destruction. But Hollywood doesn't really mind these things these days. And this is from uh, the day after tomorrow, uh, and you know perhaps again this is a this is an example of heri you know, where uh, heritage climate change debates referring to heritage sites not as real places with real people in. This is another form of discursive entrapment perhaps where uh, heritage sites get used as examples of culture, maybe similar to the idea about Palmyra I was talking about earlier. They serve an argument, they're devoid of life. Um, this is Werner Krauss's idea about the presentation of these sorts of example catalyzes uh, a, a permanent shift from the reality of heritage sites to their virtual lives as symbols. Now these examples remind us uh, that we need to explore the cultural <laughs> politics of heritage and of climate change to reflect upon how the, the history of both uh, how climate change narratives are practiced and how constructed notions of the past have an effective influence within a future orientated policy debates today. In some ways I think a lot of this comes down to when we look at heritage or we look at when it's particularly in relation to climate change debates it's about this idea of us try how we can be a good ancestor and you can see this coming through with a lot of this the fascination the contemporary fascination of the idea of the Anthropocene uh, a lot of funding calls and that are around around that at the moment I quite like Noel Castry who's added the extra s into the middle here because it's become the Anthropocene uh, is thinking about things like the heritage of possible catastrophe, where the realms of science fiction prompt us to consider the very real problems uh, for us to live up to our desire to be a good ancestor. I think concerns over both heritage and climate change are essentially founded upon a contemporary desire to be a good ancestor for future generations. There's this sort of perceived idea uh, of you know, responsibility of inheritance based on this sort of dream of preservation. Uh, which is always seemingly forever out of reach. And I think both have an inherent political edge. So rather than stopping change, I think we should be turning our attention to issues about who wins and who loses and over what sort of time scale. And I think that time scale can be very long indeed. I've been quite fascinated looking at the work of Holtoft and uh, Hobier recently when they started talking about uh, radioactivity. As soon as, ra you know, as soon as we start producing radio, you know, radiation, radioactivity through nuclear power generation, nuclear missiles, we suddenly started, should we start to think about ourselves as being a good ancestor for 50,000 years time. They have this sort of nice example where um, you imagine a sort of a, a, you know, what is now, I suppose, Sweden or somewhere where they're burying in the, deep into the granite a whole load of radioactive waste and people or maybe sentient robots or something in 50,000 years time will discover this sort of this cache with this sort of strange hieroglyph on the front and think, what's this? Is it really valuable? It looks like a, you know, it looks like some sort of wind turbine or something. Maybe it's a sort of secret of wind power and, and an energy or something. Let's open it up and see. And think, no. So, but, you know, it's, I guess, you know, therefore we have to think, well, what is the right way with this? And what has heritage got to do with it all? Heritage, I think, has a, a sense of purpose that is not to somehow preserve the current situation of simply maintaining the integrity of famous world, you know, iconic world heritage sites. And I think it should go beyond the slightly smug pretense that the replacement of coal-fired power stations with windmills can solve stuff, uh, or the rebuilding of Palmyra can solve anything <laughs> at all, and what do you rebuild it in anyway? Uh, you know, notions of vulnerability and threat and off often appear in discussions of heritage, uh, but we need to be a bit more critical, I think, uh, and to think about how that sense of vulnerability is framed. I think we need to examine the culture, you know, the cultural anxiety uh, or the politics of cultural anxiety over vulnerability and loss in order to understand the pathways of its contingency. I think it's vital that we hold a present centered and future orientated sense of heritage if we are to tease out notions of loss uh, or uh, perhaps in impending absence. And we need to be a critical reflection that challenges traditional notions of preservation, conservation, and stability. So in terms of, well, what, you know, I think what, 
so trying to sum up, I think, first of all, I think heritage must take geography seriously. Uh, I think heritage must be viewed as a process uh, rather than the need to preserve some static and time tagged national or local heritage supposedly expressing the way things used to be and bounded in a, in a, in a, in a very neat sense. Heritage is a, a dynamic expression of the values held by members of the community and these values change as do the phenomena so designated. I think we need to make space for evolution, uh, make space for change, make space for the ephemeral. Loss itself could have an, can have a heritage value, making space for endings maybe. Change is the only thing of permanence therefore. And I think we ought to make space for others uh, and non-elite stories, human and non-human, even the supernatural maybe. Uh, you know, but in opening out these spaces necessarily to prompt us to interrogate the political dimensions of power, of possibility uh, towards a forward-facing sense of legacy. Uh, and it's that political, trans uh, political contingency and transformation, was it says at the bottom there. So I think there's a need to understand political contingency and search for creative possibilities uh, of transformation. And so I guess, therefore, you know, profoundly, I think this isn't a, um, you know, this isn't a fatalist sense of acceptance or a call to do nothing. I think doing nothing tends to support the sort of essentialist notions of stability that lie behind so many dreams of sustaining the status quo. I think rather in a more a, a creative engagement with the future past, maybe we can answer a new question which perceives heritage as a strategic resource in our efforts to make the world a better place. And that's something that, again, from Holtorf and Hobio, what future, which future would we like to assist in shaping by drawing on the past and cultural heritage as, a, as strategic resources so that the world will become a better place? And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. So much in there. And uh, we'll go straight into questions because um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of them and lots for people to discuss. Jane. Thanks very much. Uh, there's a lot of people want to take in and, and think about. But I'm particularly interested in your work on national parks. I've also worked in national parks, often with indigenous groups, including recently in uh, with the Sami people. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we, yeah. but not directly. But I find that fascinating because of the whole Yellowstone model of national parks, which I'm sure you know, the sheep eater Indians were cleared out mm -hmm. and so it became a wilderness and, uh, for, the, for the nation. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of indigenous groups now that are actually pleased with, with national parks in some way they can hunt. So I'm concerned that the, the problem is more deep rooted uh, when it comes to boundedness. I agree that we've been too bounded, but there's been all these examples of trying to make these trans international um, parks between Texas, Texas and Mexico border, South Africa and Lesotho. But is, is the problem more than just heritage, you know, it's, it's a nice thought, what can we do? But if the governments, obviously, you know, the Texas, hmm. Mexico border is problematic at the moment. If the, if the governments are saying, no, there's nothing we can do about these national parks, what are the other options? I think, um, well, first of all, I, yeah, absolutely agree. There's a, this idea, you know, often indigenous people get missed out on some of these early conceptions. But you said it's, not, it's interesting you say that they're actually quite like it today <laughs> because it's places that they can hunt, you know, that, that, I guess that underlines this sense of dialogue there, that there's, there's in a sense, it's similar to, in some, maybe, maybe it's a bit of a leap, but the sort of Runnymede example, where uh, through betraying this and wiping it clear and turning it into this national site, it becomes a space where people can just do stuff. And that's, and, that, and, and I guess on a larger scale, something like these national parks are, are spaces where these sorts of things can happen. I've been reading a bit about Lake Powell, is it, on, in, uh, in the mid, in, Midwest somewhere, Colorado, I don't know, something like that. And there's a the, where, for after many, many years of the conservationists who have been very, very informed by people like Thoreau and, and so on, a sort of, uh, but certain ideas of the wilderness, which must be maintained, are starting now to have discussions with people saying, hang on, that's not wilderness, that's not, yeah, that's, not, but actually, oh, let, let, but actually, let's talk. Well, that's the start of it, really. And I think, uh, and, I, and I guess, yeah. It's not, it's not just, it's all heritage's fault. That's absolutely what I'm not trying to say. And in some ways, it's sort of trying to inject a bit of geography into it, where I think a lot of, where it's almost like heritage just gets used as an easy, easy reason to try and, you know, make, build these walls and build these boundaries. And it's sort of like both sides ought to talk to each other a bit more. Practically, though, these, these are obviously big political issues. 
Um, and I think you know having discussions about the the you know is halty is it in is it in Finland or is it in Norway? Who cares? Let's let's use that as a means to talk about something a bit more interesting than and uh, where Sami people can or would like to herd their reindeer. Then then it, then you think well if that's a touchstone where you can use to talk about something a bit different, that's great. Rather than just rather than being so transfixed on the idea so far with that particular example, I didn't go into too far with it. They're all stuck because the Norwegian constitution. Uh, doesn't allow it talks about the inalienable borders of Norway and you can't it, it, it's not possible to donate this patch of Norway to Finland and so on and there's a, and they're completely transfixed with all the sort of the the legal ramifications there's just missing the point about which which as disappointing with those articles there that they they sort of just threw that in at the end <laughs> everyone thinks this is great except for those Sami people you think well come on let's, let's let's try and do something with this then if it is great why is it great why is and saying that it's great doesn't that just show how arbitrary all these borders are doesn't that just just underline under underline the weakness of nation states as boundary as bounded objects and so that should actually itself yeah maybe i'm an idealist but that should itself i think sort of un under undermine some of those more fixed notions of the world being made up of bounded mosaics thanks very much yes on the subject of Borders and set, ha, point out, ha, they are essentially arbitrary human creations. But is there not also a sense that by bordering something off, that's what gives it an element of attraction for people to engage with? So in York, for example, by being positioning ourselves as a British city, that's what brings in the tourists, that's what promotes the heritage in itself, mm -hmm. and why people want to come and see places like this in, in the first place. Mm -hmm. There's one. I mean, I guess there's two. There's two different scales of this. That in, on a on a broad scale, borders are really powerful markers. People are ansi parsi geographer talks a lot about this. That uh, the actual shape of a of somewhere. If you, I did a sort of outline shape of of uh, if I did an outline shape of Yorkshire, without any without naming anything on it at all, everyone here would recognise it immediately. Probably Cornwall, you would as well. It helps a bit with the coast. But Yorkshire, you you probably know. If I did that with um, Buckinghamshire. Anyone from Buckinghamshire? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Would you be able to do an outline shape? Oh, sorry, I shouldn't say I'm sorry you're from Buckinghamshire. <laughs> yeah. but it's an outline shape of Buckinghamshire. Would you would you recognise it? And so the, the, the you know maybe you would, but uh, but the, you know the, not, but <laughs> but uh, where but the sort of the actual shape of a boundary immediately the te the boundaries make you know give something a huge amount of power and areas with, that have a very strong uh, if people talk about this cultural thickness, Yorkshire, Cornwall, culturally very thick areas in compared to some certain other uh, other things you know it goes with the flags it goes with the sort of the whole host of societies civil society and so on that is something really you know which is very powerful you could say there's a lot of really good things within that and it's how to hang on to the goodness within that without trying to with, without losing uh, or, or without bringing with it a whole load of baggage that is actually quite nasty I guess this is the Padstow thing. I don't know if you know uh, Sean Jones's work on uh, in Scotland. I did a bit of contrast between the Darky Day in Cornwall and her work in Scotland, Hilton of Cadbol Stone, where it's the sort of this this ancient site, early early medieval Scottish, or, or I say Scottish. I shouldn't say that. I should say Pictish. Uh, a sort of as a as a as a uh, inscribed stone, and how there's the battle between the National Museum of Scotland saying. This is Scottish heritage. It ought to be in the National Museum of Scotland. And people in Hilton saying, "No, it isn't. It isn't Scottish. It's from Hilton. This is, and you can't claim this as Scottish in any sense at all." And and the way in which they celebrated their a sort of sense of local identity in a much more inclusive manner, which contrasts strongly, I'd say, with the Darky Day example. Um, you could say, "Well, Darky Day, that's all right then, because it brings in the tourists." Is that all right? Come on, how can we challenge that? We have to. We have to think about the. The power, the power structures, which which uh, which help to build up those sorts of bounded that those boundaries, whether it's localness of Padstow or the localness of York or the localness of of, of uh, different you know nation states and things. So yeah, it's not all it's not all nasty. The local isn't. It's just we have got to think about it in other ways. Hopefully. So, I'm going to preface this by saying I'm not an academic in any way. It just seems to me that 
heritage touches a notion all, most of the time. And I've been sitting here trying to get my mind around right your comments on Tom Myron. Um, I went down to breakfast in the hotel and looked out of the window and saw Palmyra and the ghosts were walking and I don't think I've ever been in a site where I actually felt ages and there are other places that evoke that. Go down Petergate in York on a spring morning before the tourists have got there Sort of, shut, for that, <laughs> uh, sort of shut your eyes, it's, it's got some sunlight, shut your eyes to the bottom of the street and you're looking down this medieval street with this amazing building at the bottom and you're <clears> on a Roman road and, and I'm just a bit worried that there's something that's missing um, from your ideas, and it's, it's, it's interesting. I'm expressing this yeah, probably I mean, quite badly, but I don't think it's all politics or all made in the sense of being artificial. I think I think there's something about feeling the ages that's actually quite important. I get why. Well, so different answers to that. I think uh, in terms of in terms of something that is very, very powerful. As you say, heritage comes with a great baggage of emotion. I went, uh, I was down in West Cornwall last weekend and I was really, really, I, I was almost in tears because I went down to my local beach in Mausel, just outside Penzance, and uh, I always went to my rock that I sat on and uh, uh, it's gone. <laughs> you know, the rock is not meant to be, it's not meant to go, but actually even it's, it's, uh, it, the bit had fallen off and uh, where I, I could always sit perfectly just above the, yeah, above the waves, I could sit, there's the, the bit, the leaning bit, which was there, was disappeared, it just, it's been washed away. And I was absolutely bereft about that. So I think, you know, okay, you can say you're walking down Peter Gator and Palmyra, you can say, you could say, you, every, you know, everyone has that sort of, that individualized sense of somewhere really, really powerful. I mean, I'd much rather, personally, I'd, I'd, have, I'd, have, I'd have been a lot less unhappy St. Michael's Mount or something being washed away, the My Rock, which I lean against being washed away. Yeah, that was really, really important. But, you know, but without getting <laughs> too caught up with that, so you can, go, you can get, get caught up with sort of relativism with that sort of, that, that line, I think. But I, I understand what you mean, but I think um, in some ways it's the, it's the historical depth and the story. And I'm not saying, uh, I wouldn't say that Palmyra, oh, I'll just let it go, it's all, it doesn't really matter at all. But it, it's worth, I think it is worth pointing out the way in which the, it became a World Heritage Site, well it became a World Heritage Site in the 70s, but it became a, a, a heritage site when the French moved out a whole load of people. And they've been living there, their families have been living there for generations. And they moved them out in the early 1930s, shunting them down to this town down the road because they wanted this to become this heritage site. Uh, and this, this heritage site, which was judged according to uh, you know, Western architectural uh, uh, traditions, as this is the, the important bit is from the Temple of Bell in the second century AD and so on. Uh, and, you, and, and, a, and a lot of me just wants to say, well, hang on, what about those people who got shunted out there? They're living in that site. And what about, you know, if we wanted to rebuild it exactly as it was before it became a heritage site, then we should be noticing that it was actually a French prison for a long time in the 1920s. I think these sites are always extremely complex I and mean, those people who were moved could well be really pleased they were moved to their, their uh, descendants mm -hmm. when there was a tourist industry there. So I mean, I, I think the work, it just moves. I mean, there's, there's no big site <coughs> I can think of where there wasn't some displacement in order to organize it I think, it's, I think it's those complications are the important bit. We shouldn't yeah. be just airbrushing them out and, and glossing over it. So, so we're, going to go, we're going to go to the right to the back and then we'll come to Steve. So, yes. Oh, but then what's left is the, the, sort of the <coughs> putting of a structure of heritage onto the site itself is it changing completely. Then by that object, I think that there's no, there's no um, site in like the the purest form that can exist ever. How do you mean? How well, do you mean that? Sort of by going through the framework of turning something into a heritage site, 
for classifying it in any way, shape, or form, then that that, that changes that changes the site itself, like how we perceive it. So, like, sure, it then becomes a question of drawing the line of what makes it authentic. At what point is this an authentic site? Or then, perhaps you could say a more utilitarian sense, like how how can this thing be seen as perhaps inspiring for children, etc. I think I think um, I think it's that people should be honest that that these decisions are actually always being made. You know, there's going to be radioactivity is going to be there for fifty thousand years, and in fifty thousand years, I'm not sure what's going to be left of Venice or Palmyra. Probably nothing, and and should we therefore what preserve it for that long? This is a, when you look at it, that sort of longer time scale. This is it's interesting with this Jurassic Coast in a way that 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 people sort of said, oh, so the, the Jurassic, this is the the uh, you know we must preserve this the Jurassic Coast, and the, and when there was the first big storms, and people's gardens were disappearing down to the coast, people got onto the Jurassic the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site Service and started saying, but our garden, you know, the, the coast is being destroyed. And we said, yeah, exactly, it's brilliant, isn't it? Said, but, it's, but, it's, but it, you must stop it, the Jurassic Coast is being eroded. And they said, no, no, the, the heritage value, it's that process of change, which in that case, that's their outstanding, outstanding universal value, which is the sort of language you've got to use for it to become a World Heritage Site. It's that process of destruction, which is the, which is the outstanding value. And that sort of, it challenges this idea, it, it, it challenges the ideas that things you must remain the same forever, which, which of course, when you, as soon as you think about it much, you don't really get very far with it. It's sort of what well, can't can't remain the same forever. I'm not saying. Uh, I think it's more a case of being a bit more honest and open about all these negotiations and, and and dialogues that that take place, and perhaps trying to find a more positive dialogue rather than uh, you know, say as I said at the start, it's sort of a bit of a worrying a worrying phrase where heritage and boundaries and nations and things get used to support each other and answer questions in a very simplistic manner. Steve, I want to go back to National Parks, but just to comment on that, I think of the notion of an authentic monument, we tend to think we're practically <coughs> dissecting authentic, I think the bigger problem is the monument. Uh, also, I was going to say, I wasn't going to talk about Palmyra, but I can't resist saying in fact, Leptis Magda, a, a, another equally impressive site much less impressive since most of it was taken away to Virginia Water and uh, Versailles to decorate you know, monuments there. So, I mean, anyway, national parks, I think what I found quite interesting was looking back at the history of where they came from a bit more. Because for me, they, they come out of those demands by people to have access to the countryside, out of the, you know, the mass trespass and all of that. So you can't simply look at them as as a, a product of national identity, that that's how they're molded since. So looking at the history is important there. But to me, it's a bit like saying the National Health Service is an expression of nationalism. But we know it was fought for by people who wanted to have a better health, better health. At the same time, it was given by people who wanted to have a fit workforce. So I think simply dismissing it in the name is a bit, you know, you yeah, need to look yeah. at the history yeah. a bit more to, to say that these come from conflicts in society when mm. people are demanding access to nature mm. and that kind of that colors what they're about independent of whether they've got their core national mm. parks mm. yeah no, i think uh yeah i i'd, I'd agree <coughs> pretty well entirely that i think uh it's the uh tolia kelly stuff i think it's quite powerful the way that it talks about you know it does make you think about well how a national parks portrayed and what they're doing but actually you think there is a really nice positive story behind all this somewhere <coughs> Um, and in the same way, I mean, there's been some debates about you know, people blacking up in Padstow, uh, and uh, there's been a, there's a, it's quite controversial. Some of the Morris dancers and so on blacking up, and they'll say this is this, this is an expression of a history of opposition and so on. And then particularly, it came out when there's David Cameron. I don't know if you saw that a year or two ago when he he went with the Whitney the Whitney uh, Morris dancers or something, all blacked up, and he has photographed with them all, and uh, and he got a lot of Flack for it, um, and he said, "Oh, this is a noble British tradition." Is it going back to this idea that well, it's all right then because it's heritage. And you think, well, there's another story within that, perhaps, with people blacking up in the 17th, 16th, 17th century as a uh, as a form of hiding oneself to protest and so on. This is the sort of narratives that people talk about with that. But where is where does that strand lead us? And I'd say it doesn't necessarily lead us to. People who are happy to get pictured with David Cameron dressed up as Morris dancers or in Padstow. It probably leads us to people 
wearing a, a Guy Fawkes mask and putting balaclavas over their heads at uh, at, at uh, G20 summit protests and things like that. That that that, the, that so that there is a, a very yeah there is a, a much more challenging and politics uh, of people fight, struggling against uh, against authority, which yes you know, is, is uh, that some parts of it. Which I, I'd say it's it, you don't find that in present day Morris dancing. Although I don't know enough about Morris dancing to really to, to generalise, <laughs> but I think you do probably find it a lot more in anti globalisation protests, for instance. Yes, yeah, so you're probably going to get the final word. Actually, so, so final question. Yeah, um, it, I, I really enjoyed it, um, but I just wondered what your take on um, with this week with UNESCO's decision to um, not give Temple Mount in Jerusalem. They decided not to. Can't remember exactly, but it, the site doesn't have a Jewish connection. I think was the overall thing. Um, I just wondered what your views, because it just struck me that that the idea of geography and whose heritage it is is, is very important. Especially, I know it's a controversial mm -hmm. place anyway. Um, as an understatement, an understatement, yeah. but I just wondered what your view on that. Would be. I didn't. I, I haven't, haven't read anything about this actually, um, but in some senses, I mean, there's a few of the examples <laughs> there which I sort of talked about. The reality doesn't necessarily make. You know, is, is not necessarily as important as what it gets used for. And I think, you know, the devil, yeah, maybe the devil really did come and take Jan Reynolds in 1638 or something. It's a nice story about that particular patch of that, that particular monument. Um, at, you know, with the, with the Temple Mount. God, I, I don't want to say too much on that. Is no, it? So, so I was a bit worried about saying it. Oh, no. But, but um, I think, uh, I guess, the, I guess, I guess one of the big messages from this is a, is a is not to have a singular story, whatever it is, whether it's uh, the Jews were or were not associated. If you think that's not really what's the important thing here, is it? But I know a lot of people would say it is. But. So we're going to go away and read all about that and find out what the full story is. Thank you for speaking us So thank you, thank you so much, David, for your time and for presenting us with so many ideas we can uh, take away and think about. Um, we're going to go to the, we are going to go to the Eagle and Child and I'm going to get there to something to eat and something to drink. So you're very welcome to come and join us there if you'd like to. I think we'll be in the usual place up, up on the first, first floor. So do come and join us. Um, there's not a yours seminar next week, but there is one the week after next, um, uh, uh, which I'll be posting information about it's on the web pages. Thank you very much for doing the live stream as well. That was good. I hope it works better than last week's did. So thank you again, David. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.